Hello, Freedom Fiends. Tasing you with liberty while calming the hamster in your brain. Obama's drones keeping you down. The Freedom Fiends have an iron shield for your brain. And it's made of liberty. Regular host <laughs> Michael Dean couldn't be with us tonight. Instead, uh, Davi, what's he up to? Uh, well, it seems there's been uh, an outbreak of some sort of strange virus in Wyoming where politicians are rising from their graves to consume the brains of the living. And so uh, Michael W. Dean is currently in his windowless bunker fighting off hordes of politicians who are eager to eat out his substance. Instead, we have me, Derek J. Learn about me at DerekJ.me, and Davi Barker of DaviBarker.com, and Stefan Kinsella joins the fiends tonight. He is from StefanKinsella.com. Hello, Stefan. How are you tonight? Worms. Worms. Uh, A fan, I see. <laughs> that's Big fan. The, the fiend greeting, the fiend aloha. So, it should stand for something. Worms. Yeah, I don't know. it's it stands for many things. So t- uh, tonight, we've all week we've been touching on this topic: uh, intellectual property rights. We talk a, a lot about rights on the fiends, and uh, this is one that hasn't really been given attention yet. So, Stefan, uh, I thought in the context of the recent Adam Carolla uh, patent troll debacle, you as an expert could help us break it down help us know what's what's really going on when we hear about patent trolls trying to take down podcasts what's happening there and what what is first of all intellectual property rights well well, let's start there okay um so this came up in the discussion i was talking with uh, with michael we've talked about this before um copyright trolls and patent trolls came up right so these are both two different phenomena um, they refer to types of users of intellectual property, and they're called trolls. You know, the metaphor is the bridge. You know, the the, the troll who collects a toll before you can pass over the bridge. I had um, no idea that's where the term was from. Right, that makes sense though. In fact, the term was coined by one of the, I think it was an Intel um, patent attorney who was uh, pejoratively describing these people, and then he later became one of the biggest patent trolls. So I think his name was Peter Detkin or something like that. Uh, Are there any other popular like patent trolls that we would be aware of that the, the common person has, has heard of? They tend to fly under the radar. Most of them have a, a empty shell headquarter office in um, – in Texas, in Marshall, Texas, because it happens to be the patent trolling capital of the world. What? Wow, really? Yeah, this, Why there's would a little location town about, matter? Well, so there's a little town about 100-something miles northeast-ish of Houston called Marshall, Eastern District of Texas. And there are dozens of these uh, companies that have these just empty offices in these, uh, you know, office buildings there, just so they can have a, a, a space there. Oh, just because so they it's want... a retail location, like just so they've got something on paper and and in physical location. They just have an address there. It yeah. gives them the right to file with their patent lawsuits in Marshall, Texas, because that one is the best one for patent awards. The juries there and the judges they're known for, you know, getting the cases through there really quickly. And you know, now they're famous for this. Um, and they want to keep their reputation up as this is the place to go. So, you know, their whole industry depends upon is they're not tourism, they're patent lawsuit in uh, space in Marshall, Texas. It's crazy. Is anybody playing with the pun Marshall Law? Because it's screaming out at me. <laughs> no, it's just a coincidence. It's the Eastern <laughs> District of Texas, uh, technically. So uh, the biggest awards for patent lawsuits or for some reason have gravitated gravitated towards that federal district in in texas so there's lots of these uh there's been you know exposés on this the reporters go down the hall to these little uh um, these little strip centers and there's just empty empty offices with the, the lights aren't even on and they're just shingles up there you know with these one company after the other and one of them is called personal audio okay um the term patent troll refers to these companies that don't 
sell a product that is covered by their patent, they usually buy these patents up in like a uh, um, uh, when a company goes out of business or when there's an auction. So they're they just, they're like cheaper at certain times. Like people will just sell their patents because they're they're liquidating or something. Right. So a lot of times you'll have a startup company, let's say, which will have um, a venture capital that will fund it. It will start up and they'll have uh, a lot of engineers and inventors and they will come up with patents as part of their original, you know, um, no, why? Wait a minute. why would there ever even be a system for transferring ownership of patents when I mean, my understanding is the whole original purpose of patents is to sort of protect the inventor. Well, so patents like copyrights are something that is assignable. Okay, you can own. It. In fact, if you go back to the history of the way copyright worked, the original copyright system uh, was rooted in in state censorship and control of of information. Um, and, and wait, uh, so the the patents were designed to censor uh, no. information? So no, so copyrights were patents were designed to protect uh, companies from 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 competition. Oh, uh, okay. So, in fact, the statute, the patent system originated in the statute of monopolies in 1623 in England, and the copyright system originated in the statute of Anne in 1709. But that had its roots in the Stationers Company, which was a guild which had the you know the government and church granted monopoly over approving which books could be printed, you know, in the advent of the printing press. So h- how does how does all that uh, still apply, like, 300 years later to podcasts? They didn't know that they would there would be podcasts to be patented or, or not. I mean, they surely couldn't have known about the technologies um, that they've got. And protecting competition, uh, wouldn't that only inhibit further innovation? Yes. <laughs> well, <laughs> this is the problem with patent copyright. <laughs> <laughs> they're they're totally illegitimate, totally illiberal, totally contrary to freedom and the free market and uh, competition and uh, freedom of expression and freedom of the press. I mean, patent and copyright are two of the worst uh, innovations uh, or legal 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 systems that we that are in existence right now. I mean, they're they're only behind the drug war and and real war and taxes, perhaps. So help me take this to 2014. What's happening to Adam Carolla, the the guy I know and love from the Man Show? Uh, he's now got some podcasts. It's very popular, and it's under attack. Yeah, so so this is an example of why patent and copyright, which are two types of intellectual property or IP, um, the other types would be trademark and trade secret and other special forms like uh, database rights or moral rights or um, boat hole designs. Believe it or not, there's a special law for that, um, or even defamation law, which is like reputation rights. That's a type of IP. But the two big ones are patent rights is a kind of so I have a right to not be spoken ill of. Yeah, well, that's what we, if you sue someone for libel or defamation, that's what that's based upon the idea of a reputation right. Interesting. Yep. So th- that's not normally considered by mainstream media and by lawyers as a type of intellectual property, but it clearly is, uh, in my view. Um, yeah, it's um. It's uh, it's brain fruit, right? I like that's the kind of term I like to use. Well, the idea is that so you work hard to develop your reputation, so you have created something of value, which is your 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 reputation in the eyes of people in the world. Then you have a, some kind of property right in that. And mm-hmm. copyright is you worked hard to create something creative, like uh, a painting or a novel or some kind of uh, expressive work. And you have a property right in that work. And patents would be you worked hard to create an invention that is a useful technique or device that um, has value. And you have a property right in that as well. And in fact, there used to be a doctrine in copyright law called the sweat of the brow doctrine, which is that if you if you put work into something, you had a property right in it. That was a little bit eviscerated in this. Well, it says case. who did, did the courts just recognize that because there was like sweat on it like what do you what do you mean it meant that um you could determine whether you're entitled to copyright in a work if you had put a lot of work into it like making a map for example took a lot of work to make a map even though a map is just a representation of a fact like the way the world is arranged yeah what kind of like ownership can you have over the drawing of a map like drawing so you could originally have a copyright in a map, but in the Feist case, and I think 1991, the Supreme Court said they, the, the sweat of the brow doctrine um, was no longer applicable. Wow. 
So, which meant that, um, so you had these map companies doing all these crazy things to take advantage of the remnants of copyright law. So, for example, they would put things like called copyright traps in maps. So, sometimes if you look at a map, there'll be like a cul de sac or a little street, which yeah. doesn't exist. Why? The map companies put them in there on purpose just so that they could find out if someone had copied it. And they would say that oh. the copier had copied the original content, which was a false street wow right because that street is not a record of the fact that is a, exactly he, that's a work exist. of art in the middle of our map and you're copying exactly. that work of art well, so, so some what? maps out what there can they do to punish them what, what do they do what are they afraid of they're afraid of people copying the maps without permission and and, and selling the maps to people that want to buy maps yeah and i so, know but what's the punishment for people who do that i mean what bad things happen to them if they copy the map well, you can go to jail, actually. I mean, there are people in jail right now. There's a guy in jail uh, for, uh, well, he, he was sentenced to a year in jail for uploading a copy of the Wolverine movie about three years ago. In Whoa. Federal prison. Oh, it was the one where the CGI wasn't finished, right? And it was all weird, like, ray tracing stuff? I don't remember the details of I think I saw that version. Did, but it was just, you know, uh, uploading a file. It's actually criminal penalties. Uh, so is Adam account. Carolla facing jail time? No, so that's a patent case. So the Adam Carolla case, and so you asked why there can be patent trolls. The reason is these are considered to be assets in the capitalist system, right? There's a property right in, and that's why they call it intellectual property. There's a property right in a patent, and there's a property right in a copyright, and the owner can assign it to someone. And typically, they these are uh, done by employees of a corporation, and they're assigned to the to the corporation. Uh, the reason I brought up the uh, copyright case of the Stationers Guild is because the original system was the Stationers Guild, which was chartered by the government back in England, had the authority to decide which which books could be published. And then when the monopoly ran out, the Statute of Anne was passed in 1709, and it gave the right to the authors. But because the authors had no choice but to go back to the publishing guild to publish their works – the publishers immediately reassume their previous position of control, and we still have that system today, although it's eroding because of the Internet. So in other words, uh, authors of, of books still go to the publishing system, and there's like a, millions of works that are now um, in a black hole because of the copyright system. The patent system is similar in some respects um, and has led to the advent of the patent trolling problem which is what it's plaguing Adam Carolla right now. And we can go into the details well, of that. Well, have uh, patents and copyrights always been a government thing? Yes. Patent and copyright are purely statutory. Fiends, an invigorating alternative to those other shows. Hey, this is some Squizcar Squiggles from Death Clocks. And uh, you are listening to the Freedoms Fiends on the, you know, the radios. And, uh... I guess it says worms now, so there you go. You've read books, attended lectures, and you know the Constitution well enough to know it's a well-crafted blueprint to create an ever-increasing federal empire. But there's still one thing missing. Buttons! Freedom Fiends now has buttons. You'll get state speech is hate speech, guns and weed, buy sheep for sheep on sheep, and two designs for the Freedom Fiends. Wear them with pride. Use them to start conversations with statists. It's only $10 for five buttons, including shipping. Go to freedomfiends.com and click on the link at the top that says buttons. What does freedom mean? Tune in to LRN.FM to find out. LRN.FM is the Liberty Radio Network, a collection of live talk radio and podcasts, all coming from a principled pro-liberty perspective. LRN.FM show hosts aren't left, right, or conspiracy kooks. You can tune in 24-7 to LRN.FM via your phone, computer, satellite, and more. Listen free anytime at lrn.fm. That's lrn.fm. We are back chatting with Stefan Kinsella about uh, Adam Carolla's 
patent troll that he can't get off his back. Uh, is he going to jail? Uh, Davi was asking. Uh, no, because this is a patent case, says Stefan. So uh, tell us more. Uh, we're, we, we always hear the old adage, or, or people say, they claim that copyrights and patents were originally designed to protect the artists. We must protect them. But, right, uh, so who's, is that true? who's being protected? Who's Adam Carolla threatening? Right, so well, one one reason this came up uh, in recent the last week or so was because of the uh, the controversy about Stephen Molyneux and uh, the uh, DMCA takedown, uh, which has been discussed on your show and uh, Free Talk Live. Yes, mm-hmm. um, Stephen Molyneux so, is a popular YouTube philosopher. Right, and so there's there's a phenomenon called copyright trolls, which is not as common as the patent troll. And the copyright troll is someone who uses the threat of copyright to try to extract or to extort, I would say, money from other people. Uh, it's not as common. Copyright is used more often to censor speech. This case that we're talking about now with Adam Carolla is an example of where there's a kind of a crossover, where there's a patent, which is an inhibition on innovation and a tax on uh, innovation, well, but which what, also what innovation and what what is the official complaint? Okay, so here's here's how it works. Um, there was a patent, and I can give you the patent number. I, I, I was telling you guys earlier before we started that I was talking to my friend Jeff Tucker about this earlier uh, about my idea that I could go through with you guys the actually way that you because I'm a patent lawyer, by the way, so I could explain how you interpret a patent claim. Um, and this might be the most boring radio show <laughs> in all existence. So maybe we'll, well, we'll no, get started. I, we'll see how it goes. I'll guide well, you. Well, let's but take I a start think, at it, and we'll see yeah, how it goes. Yeah. So I want to so hear it because patent. you know people talk about this Adam Carolla patent troll thing, but how many people really dig into and look at the actual paperwork that's going on here? This is the, right. the these are the chess pieces that are moving around the board, right? So yes. what's happening here? So and, and and not only that, Adam Carolla probably himself um, he got, he had a like a he had like a Kickstarter or not a Kickstarter but one of those other sites uh, he campaigned to raise I don't know four hundred thousand dollars to defend himself from this. So there is a company called Personal Audio which owns a patent which is patent number eight one one two five zero four. So that's mm-hmm. eight million by the way. That means it's the eight millionth. Patent granted. There's a lot of patents wow. in the U.S. that have been granted. Eight million things you're not allowed to invent. Well, some of them are expired by now, but you know, okay. a few hundred thousand issued every year. They last about 17 years, and so this is from the beginning of the patent system. When, so when did it begin in the U.S.? Uh, like, well, so the U.S. Constitution was uh, ratified in 1789. Is that patented? And 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 that authorized the Congress to enact patent and copyright law. And the very next year, seventeen like ninety or ninety one, there was a patent and a copyright act granted. And Thomas Jefferson, wow. who by the way was kind of against patents, was uh, anointed as the first patent commissioner. It's a totally bizarre historical fluke. I mean, they wow. figured he knew a lot about inventions and technology, so he should be the first patent commissioner, even though he had written these eloquent oppositions to the the idea of having a natural right in in, in innovations. Okay. Thomas Jefferson had this famous thing where he said, "If you light your taper, which is like a, a candle, with mine, then we both have a flame." So, and that's what ideas, spreading ideas, is like. Wow. So, wow. Idea, so maybe Thomas Jefferson invented the internet. Well, Thomas Jefferson had some eloquent uh, arguments as to why pat- the patent system uh, <clears throat> makes no sense, and yet he was the first patent commissioner. So, wow, that is <laughs> I so strange. I-, I wonder what his motivation was. A- anyway, I got us off topic. You were saying that this is patent number eight million something, and I was like, wow, yes. that sounds like a yep. lot. And it's only been, I guess, you know, two hundred, three hundred years, and <laughs> so um, yeah, there's hundreds of thousands issued every year in the U.S. and in other countries. Um, yeah, this is eight one one two five zero four. So I'm looking at it right now on my screen. You, you yeah. can go to Google. You can just Google patent eight one one two five zero four, and you'll see the patent. And what it is is it's a printed document issued by the United States Patent and Trademark Office in Washington D.C. Mm-hmm. It's the result of the filing of a patent application 
typically one, two, three years before. This one was actually filed back in 1996 and issued only in 2012. So it took a while. But to they grant. last only 17 years, right? Well, under the old system, until about 10, 12, 13 years ago, they lasted 17 years after they issued. Mm. Now they last 20 years from the date of filing. Hmm. Which, oh, well, I'm curious. Uh, we've we've got more coming up. But I want to know: Are patents and copyrights could they be a thing in libertarian paradise? We'll find out more with Stefan Kinsella, Freedom Fiends. Freedom Fiends with Michael Dean. This is what radio sounds like now. Are you a political activist who does things that the government might not like? Then this free ebook may save your life. Rats is your guide to protecting yourself against snitches, informers, informants, agents provocateur, narcs, finks, and similar vermin. Rats was written by OG libertarian Claire Wolf. Rats is a short book, easy to read, and available free in many formats. Download Rats free at rats-nosnitch.com. That's rats-nosnitch.com. Creamy Radio Audio. Want caviar sound on a cat food budget? Creamy Radio Audio by the Freedom Fiends has great free tips so you can sound like a pro without spending like one. The most powerful form of human communication is one person speaking to another. But if people have to suffer through your sound, they'll change the channel and miss your message. With articles on microphones, preamps, recorders, mastering, recording remotely over the internet, doing a podcast, even getting a show on actual radio, the Freedom Fiends show you what they use and where to get it. Whether you're a talk show host, voiceover artist, podcaster, evangelist, or just want to record your loved ones for the ages, at Creamy Radio Audio, the Freedom Fiends will help you make the most of your sound. Creamy Radio Audio will help you speak to the world with sound that will make people want to keep listening. Check out CreamyRadioAudio.com. That's CreamyRadioAudio.com. Talking about intellectual property rights, Wikipedia says they are legally recognized exclusive rights to creations of the mind. And here we are to calm the hamster in your mind, talking with Stefan Kinsella, who is a patent attorney. He's walking us through the recent Adam Carolla podcast war with a patent troll the company Personal Audio, who somehow owns a patent on... Well, what exactly, Stefan? What do they own a patent well, on? so this is patent 8112504. The title of the patent is System for Disseminating Media Content, Representing Episodes in a Serialized Sequence. Okay, that's the title of the patent. Well, it sounds complicated, but this is something anyone can find like right everything. on Google. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, the t- so the title is fairly meaningless usually in a patent. And again, this was filed originally back in 1996, really before the internet even really got going. I think one of the first quasi podcasts was done in 1993, the advent of the internet, from what I hear. Yeah, um, were there even MP3s then? I mean, what was it? it a- I don't think there were MP3s quite yet. Yeah. Um, so it must um, have been really tough to consume a podcast because the file sizes would be so big it, w- it wouldn't even make any sense um, to, to listen to a program. So what these guys do is the, the patent lawyers, uh, of which I'm one, <laughs> get really creative in trying to draft the claims of a patent in a way that is as broad as possible, which means it covers as many possible new inventions that could come up in the future as possible that are described by the current invention um, without being so broad that you're going to get struck down when you submit it to the patent office. This is, this is how the system works. It's, it's kind of terrible and messy, but this is what happens. And so you have a patent that's issued. And look, I'll, I will see mistakes all the time in the media and libertarian uh, discussions 
they'll confuse patents with trademarks with copyrights. Um, if Apple files a patent and it gets published, then I'll hear reports that it was uh, there's Apple has a new patent on the following when it's not really a patent. It's just a it's just a patent application which is just pending. Really, so is that like lot- news that uh, patent attorneys follow? Like, oh, who's got the latest patent? Like, you follow? There are like eight million of these things. No, so we don't follow them, but the media follows them, and they oh. misreport them all the time. So, for example, if, <laughs> Apple, if Apple has a, a, a new patent application on uh, a, a trackpad kind of innovation, yeah, you know, probably nine tenths of the time, it's not an idea they're going to implement in one of their products. It's just, uh, it's just uh, something that their inventors are encouraged to submit, and they're going to put it in their stack of patents, and they can use it for shakedown purposes or for defensive purposes when Samsung sues them with their stack of patents later. But that's it's really whole, frustrating to people like me, because I used to have an iPhone, and I liked the swipe to unlock feature, which I understand is patented somehow by Apple. You, other companies either can't use the swipe to unlock or have to pay some sort of fee to use it. And I think that's ridiculous. It's uh, restricted my future phones from having that feature, and they've had to find creative ways to get around it so that you can still swipe to unlock, but it's a, a little bit different or more complicated. So yeah, I mean, imagine if that had happened with keys. What do you mean? No, exactly. Like, imagine if some company had patented metallic keys. Yeah, no one else can do this. Yeah, it would it would be that ridiculous. I mean, is this ever going to go away? Will my phones in the future finally, you know, will that expire and we can do the swipe to unlock thing? Or, I mean, what's the point of that even? So, as much as I hate the patent system, and I I think the patent system probably causes about half a billion dollars a year of deadweight cost to the world economy. Um, at least patents expire in about <laughs> 15, 16, 17 years. Copyrights, on the other hand, which don't cost as much on a, numer- on a financial basis, but yeah. they, they repress free speech and they give the state the excuse to um, uh, police the Internet right, and restrict Internet freedom, um, they last about 100-plus years. And so copyright is even worse. Yeah, I mean, um, the creator will be dead by the time of the copyright is still being enforced now would there be either of these things copyrights or patents in a libertarian paradise i think it's totally impossible and this is the the frustration i i i, I see as a libertarian i get the argument all the time from libertarians who say well you're against plagiarism aren't you or you're against fraud aren't you or you're against lying aren't you are you um, and you're, you're for copy you're for contract aren't you with this sort of vague insinuation that in a free market, if you had a contract system and you're opposed to fraud and plagiarism, that would give rise somehow to something like the current patent and copyright system. Um, and this is stated either by people who know that they're just lying or who don't know what they're talking about, who shouldn't be talking because there is just no way in hell you could recreate the current patent and copyright system um, in a common law decentralized system. These are purely creatures of statute and copyright uh, and legislation. How do you know state. that? Are you just speculating? Well, I know it because of the way they arose. I know it because I'm a lawyer. And how is it how is it that just talk more about its protectionist beginnings? Well, so like I said, so the, the copyright uh, copyright arose from the practice of the state and the church in preventing people from publishing books that were not approved by the official organs of the state. And this slowly morphed into the Statute of Anne, which morphed into the Copyright Clause in the U.S. Constitution, which morphed into the Copyright um, um, Act. And in fact, uh, there is just simply no doubt that the Copyright Clause um, uh, the Copyright Act in the U.S. Uh, inhibits freedom of speech. You cannot publish certain things. There have been books that have been banned by federal judges, destroyed uh, ordered to, to be destroyed, movies, uh, you know, a remake of uh, some some vampire movie, um, a sequel to The Catcher in the Rye. Um, this has happened over and over again. I mean, the Harry Potter books. One time, the book was released early, and a, a judge ordered people not to read it who had bought it too early. Wow. Um, so, so this is under what cl- penalty? What do they go to jail if they read Harry Potter? Yes, so there are there are literally criminal penalties for copyright violation and extremely um, stiff uh, c- uh, civil penalties. In, in fact, in my view, the Copyright Act is completely unconstitutional 
Uh, so is the patent law, but the copyright law is more clearly unconstitutional. And that's because, the one that came right after the Constitution? Well, so the, the copyright law was came after the Constitution in 1790 because of the, copy, the, the, the Constitution in 1789. But in 1791, the Bill of Rights was adopted, which had the First Amendment. Right. And there's a conflict, in my view, between the First Amendment and between the copyright statute, which came before it. And if there's a conflict between two federal laws, the earlier one has to fall because the later provision has to prevail. That's how we can overrule bad laws. And the courts mm. have, have admitted that there's a conflict, or they call it a tension, between First Amendment free speech and the copyright law, but they just sort of try to balance them out and say, so well, So which we one came first? Them. Well, the copyright the copyright law came first. So that's the, the one that has to stand. No, no, the, the, no, that's the, the one that has to go. Oh, okay. yeah, the later one. Right, the the la- later one governs, just like the, the later you know, one. Okay, so the newest rule is the one that. Counts. So by a strict interpretation, you'd have to say that the First Amendment nullified. Yes, the copyright law. Wow. Is that what you're yes. saying? Yes, I think the First Amendment nullified the copyright law, and the and not only the First Amendment, but the Eighth Amendment, uh, which deals with cruel and unusual punishment, because the the statutory damages for copyright infringements are insane, like seventy five, one hundred fifty thousand dollars statutory damages per infringing work. That's why this woman, Jamie Thomas, you know, was uh, who just uploaded or I think downloaded twenty files or something. Was sued uh, uh, like for a million dollars, and she just Whoa. some you know some single mother. I mean, there's these crazy Are things that have serious? nothing to do with actual damage. Oh, What's it's crazy. the worst penalty that could happen to a person who's uh, creating something that's copyrighted or patented by somebody else? Okay, so you can actually go to prison, <laughs> prison for uh, for infringing copyright. Uh, another one would be um, being revoked from your right to use the internet for life, which is the the new six strikes and you're out rule, which is a quasi private rule, which the ISPs in the country have agreed to with the government. So if you if you start um, pirating count content and you get a notice from your ISP. Then that's the first strike. Can you and just use Tor it. and then be connecting to the internet from China? Yes, yes, yes. So that 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 can. And in fact, I mean, there was like a student in England. Uh, I think his name is Dwyer, Richard Dwyer, who had a website, and on his website in England, he had links to another site, and on that that other site was a one of these pirate sites which had uh, pirated movies or files. Right, and he he was. He was uh, accused of violating American copyright law, even though he's an English, you know, British citizen. And an extradition order was issued. This is like a grad student in England. So he's facing extradition charges to come to America. He's going to be forced from his home in the UK to come to the US to face criminal charges for having a website with links. That's stone cold, insane evil. A- a- but it's laws in a country he's not even in. Yes, I know, and this is this is the problem with. I mean, I don't have to tell you. It's 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 worse than you can imagine. Wait a minute, what's really going on here? Aren't there some people who have some selfish motives? Doesn't this make any sense somewhere? It just seems all too crazy to me that a person who lives in the UK could be extradited for what downloading a few movies, and then he goes to prison in the US. He makes no sense. Just, he had a website with links. Oh, yeah, yeah. He had links. Right. What a He's criminal. He's telling people how to find something. So, so I, I think what's going on here is America is the world's bully. We're the, we're the biggest, strongest power, and, 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 and our government is controlled by special interest groups like Hollywood and the software industry and the music industry, um, and they – export American style IP law to the rest of the world, even though it's not in the other country's interests pretty much at all. And they twist the arms of other countries like our lap dogs, like the UK, and even our alleged, you know, kind of rivals like China and Russia and India to adopt American style IP law, patent and copyright, and for the pharmaceutical industry as well, which has a, a big interest in the patent law. Being exported, um, it's 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 a crazy system. Almost every free trade agreement you can look at, NAFTA, um, bilateral free trade agreements, the upcoming um, these upcoming agreements that the U.S. government is trying to push, they try to enforce on other countries to get them to adopt American U.S. style. 
patent and copyright uh, enforcement and protection for the Worms. benefit of American companies. Yeah, Worms. it's always for the benefit of American companies. They've hijacked the system, man. This is the Freedom Fiends. You're listening to Freedom Fiends with Michael Dean and some of his weird friends. And yes, we're broadcasting this into space. Have you recently defooed a cult that demands constant devotion to a figurehead? The guy who claims to be anti-IP, but uses IP to silence critics? That charming gentleman who thinks all your problems are from bad parenting? If you're tired of tithing to messiahs who demand a lot of your money, consider donating to the Freedom Fiends. We're more fun and don't require constant praise. In fact, we don't even like audience involvement. We talk, you listen, if you want. And if you send us a dollar, we won't complain. We'll dig it. That's freedomfiends.com. Worms! Wake up and smell the freedom. One of the easiest things you can do to help Liberty is to torrent Freedom Fiends episodes to help keep them drone-proof. You can set up your home computer to download and share Freedom Fiends archives over BitTorrent. You can even set up scheduling so it only shares while you're asleep or at work. Put your unused computing power to work and help keep the Freedom Fiends around well into the future. Simply go to freedomfiends.com and click on the Torrent Club link and learn how to torrent and share Freedom Fiends archives. Uh, hello, Freedom Fiends. You know, the zombies got da- uh, got Davi, Stefan. While we were away at break, the uh, the zombies ate him. Uh, he's wandering around in his backyard somewhere looking for brains. I blame the government. This just in. A listener informs me now that a computer programmer who filmed Fast and Furious 6 from the back of a cinema and then uploaded it to the internet has been jailed for almost three years. (laughs) The pirated copy of the film was downloaded 780,000 times, costing one of Hollywood's biggest filmmakers more than $4 million. I'm joined tonight by Stephen Kinsella. He's a patent attorney with the Libertarian Principles. So, Stefan, why shouldn't this kid go to jail for theft of $4 million? Oh, well, that's a... Uh, well, I guess the question is, why should he go to jail? Why should anyone ever go to jail? Uh, and this well, he is the stole $4 million, essentially, from this filmmaker. Those people well, so would he, have paid for those tickets. Yes, and so this is the essential um, argument underlying intellectual property claims, is that... Um, you have a right to potential future profits that you could have made or would have made if your mon- state-granted monopoly privilege would have been respected. Um, I just simply don't think that there's a property right in the money in potential future customers' pockets. Huh? I mean, well, so the $4 million was money that they could have made that people would have spent on it, right? So like Joe Joe, uh, Joe Black and, and, and John Green – might have spent eight dollars on a movie ticket, but yeah. they didn't have to do that because they could pirate the, the movie now. Exactly, that's the but, problem. All these people, but they, but they own their money. They don't. Uh, so the the movie studio doesn't have a property right in the money in the pockets of these potential future customers. But isn't it a implied agreement that when you're consuming media like a movie, that you're supposed to pay for it? Well, I, I, no, I don't think it is an implied agreement. I think that. Um, I think if, if people make information public, then other people are entitled to learn from and copy and emulate and compete with them based upon that information. If you don't uh, – Benjamin Tucker, a great 18th, uh, 19th century anarchist, said, you know, if you want to keep something to yourself, keep it to yourself. But if you want to make information public, then people are going to learn from it and compete with you on that on, on, on that basis. Um I don't think we're going to probably have time to go through the patent claims, which is probably a good idea of this one patent we were discussing earlier. But let me say really quickly, um, as much as I've been uh, uh, criticizing patent trolls and copyright trolls, and studies indicate that patent trolls have probably cost the U.S. economy about half a trillion dollars over the last 10 years, something like that. um, I think patent trolls are the least of our problems, and I would prefer patent trolls to 
non patent troll uh, to patent non trolls. A patent troll is someone who doesn't practice the invention and they just want to extort a payment from you. Well, that's, that's all a they patent want to do. non troll. How are they a non troll? So that's the because they don't troll. do anything. Oh, that is the patent troll. Got it. But, but a, a, a regular patent user, the one that people don't criticize, would be like say Intel or, um, or Apple. They actually have oh, patents. they're non trolls, right? But they still use patents. Yeah, but what they want to use their patents for is to stop competition. So they will use the courts to get an injunction, which makes it illegal for someone to practice that hmm. claimed idea. That so they dangerous. actually want to shut out competition. So let's say I'm a small company, a small high-tech startup company, and I get sued by a patent troll. All they want is some money, okay? It's not good. It's like a tax. I can pay that maybe, and the patent troll doesn't want to ask for too much because if I can't pay it, they don't get anything. So they don't want to ask for too much of a tax. Um, a competitor like Apple wants to kill me. They don't want me to exist. They want to kill you? Yes. Surely you're being hyperbolic. I am not. You say you're not, but we're going to have to leave it there. I want to know, I wish I could ask you more. I want to know what it's like being a patent attorney who seems to not believe in patents. That must be like hitting your head against the wall. Oh, it's like a dream. It's like a dream. <laughs> Subject for another show. Uh, well, we'll have to leave it there. StephanKinsella.com is the website. Anything else you want to plug? C4SAF.org. It's my uh, innovation uh, organization. Center uh, for the Study of Innovative Freedom. Uh, Center for the Study of Innovative Freedom. I like the C4SAF. ring of that. Yep. Worms. Worms. Meow. Meow. <laughs> All right. Freedom Fiends. Meow. Love the fiends and want to help out? We do take donations and we put them back into our Liberty Projects. You can make a donation by clicking on the spinning coin on any post. But what if you want to help, but you ain't got no cash? Or you made a donation and you want to help more? Here's how you can help. Download and seed our torrents to help keep us drone-proof. There's a torrent club link at the top of freedomfiends.com. You can also blog the fiends and share episode links on Facebook, Twitter, and elsewhere. You can rate and review our movies on Amazon and IMDb. You can rate and review the Freedom Fiends and our songs on iTunes. That really helps a lot. You can buy our movies and share them with friends or give them out as gifts. And one of the best ways to spread liberty is to buy a bunch of Freedom Fiends buttons and give them out as gifts. Wholesale prices are available, and you can also comment on our site, or better yet, comment about us on other sites. And please email the site link to all your friends. Thanks for helping spread the Fiends message worldwide to as many Liberty people as you can, especially to those who don't yet get it. You rock. Worms. Davi and Michael Dean got eaten by zombies. So here, filling in is me, Derek J. from DerekJ.me, and Stefan Kinsella from StephanKinsella.com. And one other website. Uh, thanks for joining me again, by the way. I said goodbye to you in the uh, earlier, at the end of the last segment, but uh, you were gracious enough to stay on with me and, and stay co-host while uh, Davi's brains are eaten by zombies. Yep, yep. Thank you very much. So uh, what's it like being a patent attorney who doesn't believe in patents? Well, um... So I've been a patent lawyer since 1993 or four, and I've been anti- so like the beginning I, of the internet. Yeah, and that's I became a lawyer in 1992. So and I've been anti IP since about 1993 or four. Like I was really came to my conclusions around then. So um, what tipped it first, off for you? I just kept thinking about these issues because they they nagged at me and they bothered me. Why? How um, did they even come up? Because I was libertarian already, and uh. I was not satisfied with the arguments for IP I had heard from Ayn Rand and others. I knew there was something wrong with it, and then when I started practicing in the field, it you know escalated for me. So I I looked at it 
And I, I concluded pretty quickly that I, I, mean, I think I, my first anti-IP article was 1994, 1995, right around the time when I started practicing. But I was at first kind of quiet about it because I figured that if you're a patent lawyer who opposes a system, you're going to get pushback from clients. But over the years, I found out that <laughs> no one really cares. <laughs> I mean, clients don't care what you believe. In fact, to be honest, if you have a strong opinion about something – they assume you know what you're talking about. Huh. They don't care what you think. They just want you to be competent. Um, and what I've done in my career is I focus only on defensive uses of patents. Um, I think that what I do for a living largely would not exist in a free market, but it's necessary right now. So, so you're example, like a defender of uh, you're you're a defender against people who are accused of patent infringements and copyright infringements, and you're saying that wouldn't happen in a libertarian paradise because there would be no attackers for you to there defend against. No, there, there would be no tax attorneys in a libertarian paradise, right? D tax attorneys that help defend people from the IRS or help them arrange their affairs to minimize mm -hmm. taxes. Mm -hmm. But in the current system, we need tax attorneys. Um, I imagine that doctors that uh, oppose cancer and they're trying to fight it off that are oncologists um, imagine a future where there would be no cancer and their jobs wouldn't be necessary either. But given the existence of cancer, they have to do something. So, you know, yeah, it's it's kind of a, a distasteful career. It's it's we're the grease on the wheels. You know, in a sense, we grease the wheels. We help lubricate the system um, given what exists. Um but so, like I said, I have had the luxury and I've steered my career so that I only – I, I do not participate in aggressive attacks against people. So I help companies obtain patents which they can use to defend themselves against attacks from other competitors. It's, hmm. it's a terrible, huge waste, and they know it. The companies know it. I know it. Are you no upfront with with that, uh, about that oh, with absolutely. your customers? Wow. Oh, they know it. What do they, they say? It. When you're like, hey, you're spending a bunch of, I mean, it must be, what, tens of thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands in some cases, yes. to yes. D uh, create these patents, uh, basically just to defend against future attacks by yes. by companies that want to innovate or, or steal their innovation? It's like a very expensive insurance policy, basically. Wow. What a um, mess. I mean, how does this become unraveled? Like, if to a person who sees, like, this is a big waste, this is a lot of overhead, it's producing nothing... Uh, it stops innovation. So how do we unravel this knot? Well, what we have is we have uh, – uh, what I've seen is um, an increasing number of people in the industry, you know, like uh, uh, Mark Cuban and uh, innovators, engineers. They've become increasingly skeptical of the patent system, but m most of them – have no sort of proprietarian principles. Hmm. So what they'll say is the patent system is broken. It's not doing what it was originally meant to do. Uh, so they're um, like being consequentialists, I guess. They're consequentialists. That, yeah. They're incrementalists. And I don't mind incrementalism, but the problem is they never strike at the root. Um, they'll say that we oppose stupid patents. Or we oppose... Um, patents that shouldn't have been granted, or we oppose ab the abuse of the patent system. And I find that frustrating because from my knowledge of the system and the way it works and my libertarian kind of foundations, if you got rid of the patent trolls, okay, which some, some legislation has proposed, if you just eliminated the patent troll problem, and if you got rid of so-called abusive patents, and if you improve the quality of the patent system – the fundamental problem would still remain. It would still be the big problem is that you have large companies with lots of patents that they can use to intimidate upstart small companies from competing with them. Like who? So Who's doing that now? Like Apple? Yeah. So so an example is the um, the smartphone industry. So you have these huge multi-hundred million dollar lawsuits going on between Samsung and Apple. But and I'm seeing a lot of innovation in smartphones. Yes, there is innovation. So you're but, saying it's stopping innovation, but I'm not seeing that. Just well, to I play devil's it, advocate here. No, no. So I, there is innovation. There's innovation by the companies that remain behind the walls, but it's it's like a cartel. So there's a small number of companies that are entitled to compete in this area. Um, and, they, of course, they innovate because they're competing with each other. 
but they're protected from competition because small companies can't compete with them because they will be sued out of existence by the patent threat. Hmm. So I think there's just less innovation than there would be. Um, Wow. So it's just it's, it's, it's we we do have innovation despite the the uh, the restraints imposed on us um, by the state. Um, you say the critics of patents aren't striking the root. What is the root of the patent issue? So the root of the patent issue is that there is nothing fundamentally wrong with competition, and competition means that. If you observe someone starting to be successful in the market because of a new technique or a new business model or a new innovation, then you observe that they're making profits. Um, there's a, a price signal by the monetary system. Um, so you observe that and you start competing with them. This is what the free market is. It's the ability for people to compete with each other and to try to capture you know, future potential uh, revenue from potential future customers. Um, the patent system um, imagines that there's something wrong with competition. There's something wrong if it's too easy to compete. And in fact, even some free market proponents um, who advocate the IP system, they will say that we can't have unbridled competition. Now, Anyone that says they're against unbridled competition, to my mind, is in favor of bridling competition, which means you know, they want to restrict it. Um, yeah, but they have this, uh, I, just they to put on idea. my devil's advocate hat here, they, they just want the benevolent government to oversee competition and make sure that people aren't acting unfair, right? They want, they want some arbit, uh, arbiter, yes. some, some justice in the market. Yes, and of course the government takes a cut every time it's it's put in the position of being this arbiter. It takes a cut; it's its own cut, and it uses its control to control the market and steer it in the direction that it wants. Uh, one problem with the patent system is that um, the patent system can only give these limited monopoly privileges for certain types of innovations and other things. It doesn't give innovation uh, give awards for like. Uh, Abstract ideas, or you know, or, or mathematical algorithms. Uh, Einstein's E equals MC squared would not have been eligible for patent protection because it's a law of physics, and yet it's arguably as beneficial to the human race as you know, as, as the rounded corners on an iPad. Um, but um, um, and so, so, th- th- so the system that the government puts in place always gives rewards to some things and doesn't for, to other things, and this distorts the very structure of innovation. It causes companies to invest millions of dollars of their R and D funds, you know, the research and development funds, into certain areas that could be protected by patents and not into others. So it causes us to try to invest more money into creating new practical gizmos and less into fundamental research and development. And then the government comes along and says, well, then we don't have enough you know, private dollars going into fundamental research and development, so we have to have the national endowment for the humanities or you know, the, uh, the federal government has to fund all these companies. So it's just a huge quagmire. The FDA process – so probably the, the strongest – so-called argument for patents is the pharmaceutical case because people say you have to spend millions of dollars to develop and test a brand new drug, which may fail. And by the time you have gotten through the testing process, you're going to have all these competitors ready to go and you won't be able to recoup your development costs. So you need a patent to, uh, to protect you from competition for some period of time. So, the government imposed FDA system is used as an excuse for the government to impose the patent system. How are inventors supposed to even know any of this? I mean, say I've got some great product that I want to put out to market. How do I navigate all these silly rules? Well, they 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 have just a general sense, right? They have an idea that um, there's a way that they could protect themselves, but they know the legal system is very expensive, and they're right about that. And they basically can't. So what happens is they become employees of corporations, and they assign their mm-hmm. rights upon employment to the corporations. 
um, just well, as authors do. Why not go so, independent? Why not just make their innovation and say, I don't want to get a patent. I'm not going to register with the government. What would happen? Well, well, so a couple of reasons. So if, if, if they were just to go independent and not get a patent, then they, then when they seek funding from a venture capitalist, the VC is going to say, well, do you have your patent rights locked up? Uh huh. And they'll say no. And if you say no, they'll say, well, then how are you going to stop big corporation A or B from suing you? And they'll so say, so it's I, inevitable that if you don't have a patent, Big corporations are going to scoop them up and then sue you, even if you created the original invention. So there is a danger that if you don't patent your invention, that someone else could patent it as well. Um, and then you would be uh, uh, ab- unable to even use something you came up with yourself. That mm. is one danger of not patenting uh, or or making public your ideas. Yes. This is the it's Freedom a, a Fiends. Conundrum. We'll be back with more. Worms. You and the hamster in your brain are listening to Freedom Fiends with Michael Dean and his weird friends. Shiny badges on your jacket. Shiny badges. This is Davi Barker from shinybadges.com, and I just want to personally apologize for airing a jingle week after week, month after month, that turned out to be such an infectious brain worm. So to make it up to you, I'm offering a free gift. The next time you make a purchase at shinybadges.com, write worms in the transaction comments, and I'll send you something weird. Worms. Welcome back, Davi. I, I heard it was a rough time with those zombies. You fought them off? What happened? Now, I had to crush some skulls and stuff, but luckily libertarians are immune to the virus. So, uh, you know, <laughs> a couple bites and scratches, but I'm A-OK. Good to hear that. Boy, it's good to have you back. I was just chatting with uh, Stefan about uh, his sorcery, being a patent attorney. It's like he casts magic spells. You have to uh, know the the right words to say in court, and you have to know all these silly rules that uh, govern property, like, over ideas. Sounds kind of crazy to me. And uh, it sounds like he doesn't even believe in these patent things, but he's doing it anyway, to protect the people. (laughs) What kind of people have you protected, Stefan? Oh, my Lord. Um... I have a lot of private clients that. Oh, whose okay. Well, you don't have to. I, I can't divulge, of course, but sure. Yeah, I, I, I give people advice on DMCA takedowns and uh, patent trolling issues all the time. So, what's a DMCA takedown? Well, that would uh, that would be something you guys brought up recently on your show. The DM, DMCA is the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. I think Ooh, it was. Oh, sounds high tech. Yeah, it was an extension of the copyright law, and. Back from the, 1790? Well, the copyright law is like 1790. But so the they DMC- added something to a law from 1790, just oh, yeah. stacked it, it right is. on top. That This will fit. I think Bill Clinton did this. I, I think it was I think it was 1998. I think it was when I was a, a, brand, a, a fairly new lawyer. Um, and w- the one good thing about the DMCA was that it added this thing called uh, – it was a safe harbor. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, I don't think it would be added now, just like if you poll Americans, would you support the First Amendment or whatever? If you just read them the text, they'll say, no, that's crazy. Um, it wouldn't make it right now. Um, it inadvertently added a provision that allowed the Internet to flourish, um, which was this DMCA takedown system, which says that if you are an ISP or some kind of Internet service provider yeah, and – um, you have content posted by your users on your site, like comments or blog posts or whatever. Sure. If it is infringing someone's copyright or if it's a defamation claim, remember I mentioned that earlier, 
Um, under previous law, it wasn't clear whether the ISP would be liable under secondary liability provisions of the law for what their users did. Hmm. These laws made it clear that you would not be liable for your users' actions if if you complied with the DMCA takedown procedure. Which, so, is, which is what? What's the procedure? Fill out a which form? Is that, go complain which is to the that government? You're not, you're not liable for what your users do if you comply with a takedown notice by someone who complains about what they did. Oh, man. This makes... Oh, so it this seems... Is- so you're essentially saying that the DMCA policy at YouTube is not really set by YouTube; it's set by this law. Of course, 100%. okay. So all of these sayings that like a DCA complaint is an appeal to a private company, which is YouTube, is false. This is an appeal to law. It's 100 percent appeal to law. Completely false that it's a private um, system. It's simply what these companies have been forced and coerced into doing because if they don't comply. They could potentially be bankrupted because of the outrageous copyright fines that they could be subjected to under secondary liability for the actions of anonymous web users. But mm. if this system had not been put in place inadvertently uh, in the in 1990s, we wouldn't have had YouTube. We wouldn't have had uh, uh, Why Facebook. Not? Because there's too much liability for all the content that's posted by the users of these sites. Yeah, but couldn't they just not have a, a rule and then uh, let everyone be fine? So if if we didn't have the DMCA's uh, safe harbor provision, yeah, then then if, then you think that internet service providers would be held liable for things yes. like slander when their users uh, type comments on a website. And that are and slanderous copy- and copyright infringement too. So, if, so if a user posts a YouTube video which has a clip of a song in it in the background, like say you take a a, a movie of your daughter dancing at a party and yeah. there's a Michael Jackson song in the background, and you post that onto YouTube, then under conventional copyright rules, YouTube could be liable for copyright infringement as a secondary um, uh, sort of uh, infringer along with the user. So what they would obviously do is they just wouldn't allow any of that. So wow. YouTube would not have existed. Facebook wouldn't have existed. This is this is news to me. I had no idea I, I, that a law could actually do some good. We've talked about patents crushing innovation in the market. Next, I want to ask about patents affecting artists. You're listening to Worms. Fiends with Michael Dean and his weird friends. Tasting you with liberty since 2011. Learn more at freedomfiends.com. When you shop online, please do it through the Freedom Fiends Amazon link over on the right side of freedomfiends.com. It won't cost you any extra, and the fiends will get a little taste from Amazon, and Amazon will save you the danger of drive-by stabbings at your local mall. Amazon sells pretty much everything you can buy on this earth, except for guns and weed. But they do sell the DVD Guns and Weed The Road to Freedom. So get that for your gun-hating stoner brother or neocon gun nut dad. They'll thank you for it. That's freedomfiends.com. Freedom, Foxtrot, Echo, Echo, November, Sierra.com. Well, we've talked about how patents crush innovation in the free market. So how do patents and copyrights affect artists, Stefan? So imagine you're a documentary producer, okay? You're trying to do a documentary. There are amazing number of complications. There are documentaries that have been hijacked and produced, uh, sorry, stalled for years because of these clearance issues. Um, you, I produced a documentary with a bunch of copyrighted music in it. Well, the music is one problem. Okay? So, <laughs> and it's on YouTube. But, yeah, so let's just say you're just going down the streets of New York or some city just filming things. Um, cities are now claiming a... C- a copyright type right in the skylines. So, for example, 
in Paris, in Paris, the Eiffel Tower, um, they, uh, the, the city of, I don't know if it's the city of Paris or some governmental agency over there, they claim a copyright in the photographs of the tower at night, but wow. not during the day. Because there's like the lights are lit up and you can see the the image. So do they and only the, own the image of the Eiffel Tower skyline at night? They yes, don't own the night. one during the day. That's fascinating. So if you, how how can anyone tell the difference if you're just using the profile, for example? Well, there, there's an increasing number of techniques that these right holders use to mm. detect copyright infringement. And another one would be the Port Authority in New York. You know, the one that was in control of the 9/11 sort of. Uh, um, uh, issue um, their control. First responders are, asserting, are heroes. Yeah, they're asserting a right in the New York skyline images right now. So it's it's just crazy. So if you're if you're a documentary producer, you can't even um, uh, 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 you have to limit yourself in what you can produce. Uh, you have to get publicity rights from the people that are shown. There's defamation rights to worry about. There's or else what? Issues. I mean, what what do these things all mean? Are they all jail time? Are they fines? Or are they, no, you know, you have I to think... take your product away from YouTube or what? Like, what's the worst that could happen to me? I, I used a bunch of copyrighted music in my documentary, and I felt like that was fine. I also produced a, another version without the copyrighted music. Uh, so people have a choice. Hey, if you're, you're, if you're anti-IP... Um, well, go ahead. You, you can have your pick. But uh, So what's the worst that could happen to me? I use like 20 different songs. Or am I going to have 20 different lawsuits? Well, you could have a lot more than that, actually, if, if people cared. You know, uh, the, the, But I don't charge for the documentary. It's just free. So is that, is that okay? No, that doesn't make it okay. This, this is the problem with copyright law. Just because it's non-commercial or not profit doesn't mean that you're in the clear. Um, the, the 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 real problem is that you're not going to get funding from anyone or you're not going to get distribution because they're going to know that this is a dodgy project unless you can show that you've cleared all the ha- the hurdles and you've got everything cleared um they're not going to fund it because it's it's a risky a risky venture so, so it that's makes one everything- obstacle but that can't be the only obstacle i mean what if you jump over that one what if you find some angel investment then yeah, but, you can make your it, movie it, right and you could but an investor wants to make a profit or they want their money back. Right. And if they think that your project is going to be sued into the ground because of copyright lawsuits or <laughs> trademark lawsuits, they're, they're, they're not going to trust it. That's not as attractive. They're going to get advice from lawyers saying, you know, st- steer clear of this unless these guys are big players who know what they're doing. So is this um, what happens? Does this, I mean, is this just theoretical? Is this in your head or does this really happen? This happens all the time. I mean, this is like endemic in modern society. We don't see it because we see what we see, right? We don't see the projects that we don't see. You know, we don't see the projects that were abandoned because of copyright um, or because of threats. That's like um, one of those uh, principles of opportunity cost, like uh, the the unseen, um, the things that people would do with their money if it weren't being spent on, you know, whatever they're forced to spend their money on. Taxes, for example. I, I think so, yes. I think that um, in, intellectual property, not to get too theoretical, but I think it basically results from a, a misunderstanding of the nature of property rights. And it comes from John Locke in the 1600s who came up with this idea that the reason we have – property rights in things is because we labor. We we mix our labor with them. Is that true? So there's a, See, that sounds just like the sweat of the brow doctrine you were talking yes. about earlier. Yes, it all mixes together. And in fact, communism, right, results the in labor, labor theory, theory of value. Yeah. Of value. So Locke was the labor theory of property, which I think in a way led to or contributed to the labor theory of, 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 of value. Um, well, is his theory whole, correct or is he bunk? I think it's it's a mistake. Um, I, I understand why he did it, given what he was responding to, Filmer and the defense of monarchism. He was trying to say that if you transform an unowned resource that God gave to the world, then you have a better title to it than someone else. But his argument was you own yourself because God gave you yourself, whatever that means. Um I guess that means your body. He's not really clear. Some of these earlier writers are more metaphorical than we sometimes are now. Um, and you own your labor, 
Now, to my mind, as a Misesian, as an Austrian, as a rational thinker, labor is just an action. And when you say you own your actions, to me, that makes no sense whatsoever. An action is what you do with something that you already own. Um, so you can see. Well, what the, about the, owning like responsibility for your actions? Yeah, it's the product of your of your actions. You. Uh, I don't think you, you own, own the results of your actions, and that includes liability. Yeah, ownership means the right to control. Okay, as a lawyer, that, that's what it means. The right to control. Uh, responsibility is a different thing. Responsibility is what someone else is entitled to claim from you. So to say that you own responsibility or you own an action is just. Um, a confusing way of putting it that's just bound to lead to So confusion. how would you put it, if, okay. if not with the word own, what, what, do you, what sort of relationship does a person have with uh, responsibility? So I think that when you, com- when you commit, when you, when you cause harm in a certain way to someone else's property, basically when you invade their property, um, you give rise to a relationship in which they are a victim and they're entitled to claim something from you in restitution or something like that. That seems fair. So, yeah. So so basically... Um, I go stomp on my neighbor's flowers. I have to repair those flowers or do something, you know, to correct that because I've, yes, I've wronged them. That's restitution. And you can say, I own that. That just means I am admitting in common parlance, right? I'm admitting that I'm the cause of it and I have to make make it good somehow. Yeah. Um, but ownership technically just means the right to control a resource. So to, to mix these things, I think it can only lead to confusion. Just like using the labor theory of value and the labor theory of properties led to intellectual property and communism and millions of deaths. <laughs> I mean, these are big, big, big errors in my view in the last two, three hundred years. I'm an anarchist, but I'm going to put on my minarchist hat for a moment. There I am. I'm going to pretend to be a person who believes in the minimal state necessary, the the minimum level of government, just protection of uh, life, liberty, and property. The night watchman state, right? Right. So, Stefan, isn't this a problem that can be solved with voting? (laughs) Well... (laughs) Okay, you asked me, right? (laughs) So, the, the, the Randians, the objectivists, will say that um, – um, in fact, they will explicitly say that we're not really in favor – they're not really in favor of limited government or minimal government. They're in favor of rational-sized government. So if in a time of war, let's say, we need 50 percent, 60 percent, 70 percent of the GNP to defend ourselves from a foreign threat, that's the rational size of government. Hmm. So in a way, seems they seems like too to- much. Well, it seems like too much, but they at least admit that they're not in favor of minimal government. And uh. I don't know as a – look, I'm a radical anarchist, uh, Rothbardian, proprietarian. I don't know what limited government means. First of all, every government is limited. No government is omnipotent. They're all limited by nature. Okay, so when you say you're in favor of limited government, you're stating a truism. Everyone in the world, even Hitler, is in favor of limited government. Hmm. So the question is, what limits are you in favor of, right? So then the Americans will say, well, the Constitution. Well, okay, fine. Well, the Constitution is pretty goddamn broad, okay? So, um, sorry, I can't cuss, can I? Yeah, watch watch your language. All right, sorry, fair about that. That's okay. So um, so limited government is, is a myth, a, a chimera. It it cannot exist. Um, the minimalist state idea of the night watchman ideal, I think, is a is a uh, is a, is a mythological ideal. What I find ironic is that we, I find minarchists or ultra minarchists like Robert Nozick, people like that, they will uh, berate or mock or ridicule or criticize anarchists for advocating something that's unrealizable. Even though they're advocating the limited state or the well, minimal state, I mean that's even advocating something that is contradictory in a sense because the minimal state is supposed to its primary role is to protect private property, and yet its primary modus operandi is to violate private property. So, 
But if yeah, the people this- saw that this was so immoral and this is wrong and this is ruining innovation, then can't they just uh, vote to change the law? I'm still wearing well, my minarchist hat. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I never got a chance to vote on the patent law. I mean, that was enacted in 1790. And, you know, no, you can't. All these politicians are in the in the in the in 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 the bed of the uh, of Hollywood and the pharmaceutical industry. You know, mm. there, there's no way they're going to to oppose it. I mean, the most radical patent reform or copyright reform laws you will ever see is a slowing of the increase in protection. That's it. Um, and if anyone ever says. We should maybe slow down the increase in the growth of patent protection. Then all the patent proponents will say, you're radical. You're trying to disrupt the system. Maybe we should do away with patents altogether. I would love to see a world like that. A free world where people can create what they want. This is Freedom Fiends, patent pending. You're listening to Freedom Fiends. Go to freedomfiends.com to help keep it drone-proof. Hi, this is Michael Dean from the Freedom Fiends Radio Show. The internet has lowered the cost barrier for a worldwide radio show to a price approaching zero. Yet there is one arena where you still need thousands of dollars to approach the audio quality of the corporate media. Doing a live spoken show with more than one host in different geographic locations. Our program, Fiend Phone, will solve that problem and it will be given away free. Go to fiendphone.com to see what you can do to help. That's F E E N P H O N E.com. Worms. I don't think we purr enough on this show. Can you purr? Ooh, that's lovely. Keep doing it. (laughs) All right, so (laughs) this is redemption in the third act. We got to leave these listeners smiling before they close their eyes and enter dreamland. So tell us, Stefan Kinsella, is it hopeless? Or is there hope? So, to my mind, this is tied up with the the state question as well. Um, is there hope? And I think there is hope. Um, I hope there is hope. Um, with technology and the way the world is developing right now, um, in the IP field, I think in the copyright field, there is hope in a lot of hope in the encryption area, right? So we can use bit torrenting. Basically, copyright is 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 dead. They can in, inflict penalties on us for violating it, but they can't stop pirating. It's happening all over the place, and I think that's a good thing. In the patent area, I think that is harder to defeat with something like uh, uh, torrenting. But 3D printing is posing a challenge to pa- to patents, and I think it will become an, in- an increasing um, um, tool we can use to escape the patent system as well. So I think with technology, basically, uh, uh, the Internet, encrypted technology, torrenting, and with 3D printing, that we are going to slowly escape the, the strictures of the old world copyright and patent system. So, yeah, I do see hope. That is hopeful. Hey, I wonder if uh, torrenting and encryption and 3D printing are all parts of the solution uh, to ending copyrights and the tyranny of patents. Can we combine, like, all three? Can you encrypt your torrent files for 3D printed guns and then be, be completely safe and destroying the world of patents and copyrights? No, I think there there's a convergence in the sense that, right, so you could encrypt a file. And look, I think the, the pattern for making a 3D gun 
is going to be very small, so it's going to yeah. be easy to send. And you can and, encrypt your internet traffic. So even the torrents that you're sending out, you know, if you've got a VPN, a virtual private network, uh, you could be up, you know, sending out torrents so that people can download these gun files, and uh, there would be no way that the government could trace back to you, right? Or, or you know, whoever's looking. Uh, or I guess it would be more difficult for them, right? I, I think so. I hope so. I mean, and I think none of us are experts, but it seems like there are options here uh, that people aren't pigeonholed. Uh, they aren't without options. Well, I mean, look, if you have – as 3D printers get better and better, and this could be the revolution of the century, right? I mean, I don't know. Um, the internet could be, but I think, I'm think i starting to think 3D printing could be. Yeah. We're, 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 at the, we're, we're at the beginning of this revolution. It's like the next Gutenberg press. Yes, and I just think, I mean, if you have to walk over to a neighbor's house and put a USB thumb drive into their computer and get a file that's, you know, 10 megabytes or something or one gigabyte, it's not that big anymore, um, or just an email that's encrypted. I, I just think it, the government cannot stop this. The entrenched interest cannot stop this, and this will increase competition. It will increase um, the pressure on the entrenched industries. And I think it's a good thing. So I'm I'm actually hopeful, to be honest. Um, I I personally don't want to move to, you know, New Zealand or Chile or Liechtenstein or something like that, or even Canada. Um, I know America has problems, but um, I think that we are getting richer and richer. Technology is blossoming, and it helps the government, but it helps the people even more. I think because um, because because the government is slower than we are so i'm uh, i'm actually optimistic me too the government is much slower than we are and they're just incentivized by money not morals well thanks to encryption and 3d printing and torrenting hopefully copyright will be dead soon this has been Derek j and stefan kinsella of stefankinsella.com Davi Barker of DaviBarker.com I hope we've calmed the hamster in your brain tonight. Michael Dean will be back next week after the zombies are defeated. Worms. 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 And brains. 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 brains.